Cuttings. It was quite a shock being back in London. After so much time in Ayos Nicolaus, which wasn't very much more than an overgrown fishing village, I found myself consumed by the city and I was unprepared for the intensity of it. The noise, the number of people in the streets. Everything was greyer than I remembered and it was hard to cope with the dust and petrol fumes in the air. The amount of new construction also made my head spin. Views that I had known all my working life had disappeared in the space of two years. London's various mayors, with their love of tall buildings, had allowed different architects to gouge their initials into the skyline, with the result that everything was both familiar and alien at the same time. Sitting in the back of a black cab being driven along the River Thames on the way from the airport, the cluster of new flats and offices around Battersea Power Station looked to me like a battlefield. It was as if there had been an invasion and all those cranes with their blinking red lights were monstrous birds picking over carcasses lying unseen on the ground. I had decided to spend the first night in a hotel, which was frankly weird. A lifelong Londoner, I had somehow degenerated into a tourist and I hated the hotel a premier inn in Farringdon, not because there was anything wrong with it, it was perfectly clean and comfortable, but because that was where I was forced to stay. Sitting on the bed with its mauve cushions and sleeping moon logo, I felt perfectly miserable. I was already missing Andreas. I had texted him from the airport, but I knew that if I FaceTimed him, I would probably end up crying and that would prove he was right. I should never have gone. The sooner I was in Suffolk, the better. But I wasn't ready to make the journey yet. There were one or two things I had to do. After an intermittent sleep and a breakfast, egg, sausage, bacon, beans that looked identical to every breakfast ever served in a cut-price hotel chain, I strolled over to King's Cross, to one of the storage depots built into the arches under the railway lines. When I moved to Crete, I had sold my flat in Crouch End and almost everything in it, but at the last moment I had decided to hang on to my car. A bright red MGB Roadster, which I had bought in the moment of madness that had coincided with my 40th birthday. I had never thought I would be driving it again and storing it. It had been a crazy extravagance. I was paying £150 a month for the privilege. But I just couldn't bring myself to get rid of it, and now, as it was wheeled out for me by two young men, it was like being reunited with an old friend. More than that, it was a part of my former life that I had back again, just sinking into the cracked leather of the driver's seat with the wooden steering wheel and absurdly old-fashioned radio above my knees made me feel better about myself. If I did go back to Crete, I decided, I would drive it there and to hell with the problems of Greek registration and left-hand drive. I turned the key and the engine started first time. I pumped the accelerator a few times, enjoyed the growl of welcome that came from the engine, then drove off, heading down the Euston Road. It was mid-morning and the traffic wasn't too bad, which is to say that it was actually moving. I didn't want to go straight back to the hotel, so I drove around London, taking in a few sights just for the hell of it. Euston Station was being rebuilt. Gower Street was as shabby as ever. I don't suppose it was coincidence that brought me into Bloomsbury the area behind the British Museum, but without really thinking about it, I found myself outside Cloverleaf Books, the independent publishing house where I had worked for 11 years, or what was left of it. The building was an eyesore, boarded up windows and charred bricks surrounded by scaffolding, and it occurred to me that the insurers must be refusing to pay out. Perhaps Arson and attempted murder hadn't been included in the policy. I thought of driving out to Crouch End, giving the MG a good run for its money, but that would have been too dispiriting. Anyway, I had work to do. 
I put the car in an NCP in Farringdon, then walked back to the hotel. I didn't need to check out until noon, which gave me an hour alone with the coffee machine, two packets of complimentary biscuits and the internet. I opened up my laptop and began a series of searches. Branlow Hall, Stefan Codrescu, Frank Paris, murder. These were the articles I found. A murder mystery, stripped of its intrigue and told in just four indifferent chapters. The East Anglian Daily Times, 18th of June 2008. Man killed at Celebrity Hotel. Police are investigating the murder of a 53-year-old man after his body was discovered in the five-star hotel where he was staying. Branlow Hall, located close to Woodbridge in Suffolk, charges £300 a night for an executive suite and is a much sought-after venue for celebrity weddings and parties. It has also been used as a location for many television series, including ITV's Endeavour, Top Gear and Antiques Roadshow. The victim has been identified as Frank Paris, a well-known figure in the advertising industry who won awards for his work on Barclays Bank and for the LGBT rights organisation Stonewall. He rose to be creative director of McCann Erickson in London before moving to Australia to set up his own agency. He was unmarried. Detective Superintendent Richard Locke, who is heading the investigation, said this was a particularly brutal murder that would seem to have been carried out by a single individual with the motive of theft. Money belonging to Mr Paris has been recovered and we expect to make an arrest shortly. The murder took place on the night before the wedding of Aidan McNeil and Cecily Traherne, whose parents, Lawrence and Pauline Traherne, own the hotel. The body was discovered shortly after the ceremony which had taken place in the hotel garden. Neither of the couples was available for comment. The East Anglian Daily Times, 20th of June 2008. Man held in Woodbridge killing. Police have arrested a 22-year-old man in connection with the brutal murder of a retired advertising executive at Branlow Hall, the well-known Suffolk Hotel. Detective Superintendent Richard Locke, who is in charge of the investigation, said, This was a horrific crime committed without any scruples. My team has worked quickly and very thoroughly and I am glad to say that we have been able to make an arrest. I have every sympathy for the young couple whose special day was ruined by these events. The suspect has been remanded in custody and is due to appear at Ipswich Crown Court next week. The Daily Mail, the 22nd of October 2008. Life imprisonment for Hammer Horror Suffolk Killer. A Romanian migrant, Stefan Codrescu, was sentenced to life imprisonment at Ipswich Crown Court following the murder of 53-year-old Frank Paris at the £300-a-night Branlow Hall Hotel near Woodbridge, Suffolk. Paris, described as a brilliant creative mind, had recently returned from Australia and had been planning to retire. Kudrescu, who pleaded guilty, entered the UK when he was 12 years old and quickly came to the attention of London police investigating Romanian organised crime gangs involved in cloned credit cards, stolen UK passports and false identity documents. Age 19, he was arrested for aggravated burglary and assault. He was sentenced to two years in jail. Lawrence Traherne, the owner of Branlow Hall, was in court to hear the sentence. He had employed Codrescu, who had been at the hotel for five months, as part of an outreach programme for young offenders. Mr Traherne said that he did not regret his actions. My wife and I were shocked by the death of Mr Paris, he said in a statement outside the court, but I still believe that it is right to give young people a second chance and to try to integrate them into society. But sentencing Kodrescu to a minimum term of 25 years, Judge Azra Rashid said, Despite your background, you were given a unique opportunity to turn your life around. Instead, you betrayed the trust and goodwill of your employers and committed a brutal crime for financial gain. 
the court had heard that Codrescu, now 22, had racked up debts playing online poker and slot machines. Jonathan Clark, defending, said that Codrescu had lost touch with reality. He was living in a virtual world with debts that were spiralling out of control. What happened that night was a sort of madness, a mental breakdown. Paris was attacked with a hammer and beaten so badly that he was unrecognisable. Detective Superintendent Richard Locke, who made the arrest, said that this was the most sickening case I have ever encountered. A spokesperson for Screen Counselling, a Norwich-based charity, has called on the Gambling Commission to ban online betting with credit cards. That was the story. The beginning, the middle and the end. By trawling through the internet, I came across what might have been a coda to the whole affair had it not actually predated everything that had occurred. Campaign, the 12th of May, 2008. Last call for Sydney-based Sundowner. Sundowner, the Sydney-based advertising agency set up by former McCann Ericsson Supremo Frank Paris, has gone out of business. The Australian Securities and Investments Commission, the country's official financial watchdog, confirmed that after just three years, the agency has ceased to trade. Paris, who began his career as a copywriter, was a well-known figure in the London advertising scene for more than two decades, winning awards for his work on Barclays Bank and Domino's Pizza. He created the controversial Action Fag campaign for Stonewall in 1997, promoting gay rights in the armed forces. He was himself completely open about his sexuality and was well known for his extravagant and flamboyant parties. It has been suggested that his move to Australia was prompted by a decision to tone down his public image. In its first month, Sundowner picked up some significant accounts, including Von Zipper sunglasses, wagon wheels and custom footwear. However, its early success took place against a subdued market that led to a significant shrinkage in consumer and advertising spending. Internet advertising and online videos are the fastest growing areas in Australia and it's clear that Sundowner, with its emphasis on traditional rather than digital media, had arrived too quickly at the last chance saloon. So, what was I to make of all this information? Well, I suppose it was the editor in me that noticed that every single one of the reports had described the murder as brutal as if anyone was ever murdered gently or with affection. The journalists had managed to sketch in the character of Frank Paris with what few details they had. Award-winning, gay, extrovert, ultimately a failure. That hadn't stopped the male from characterising him as a brilliant creative mind, but then they would have been prepared to forgive him for almost anything. He had, after all, been murdered by a Romanian. Had Stefan Codrescu really been involved in gangs, trading passports and credit cards, etc.? There was no evidence of it, and the fact that the police had been investigating Romanian gangs could have been entirely coincidental. He had, after all, been arrested for burglary. As for the brilliant Frank Paris, there was something almost bizarre about his turning up in a hotel in Suffolk particularly on the night of a wedding to which he had not been invited. Pauline Traherne had told me he was visiting relatives, so why hadn't he stayed with them? The mention of Detective Superintendent Richard Locke worried me. We had met following the death of Alan Conway, and I think it's fair to say we had not got on. I remembered him. A big, angry police officer who had swept into a coffee shop on the outskirts of Ipswich shouted at me for 15 minutes and then left again. Alan had based a character on him and Locke had decided to blame me. It had taken him less than a week to identify Stefan as the culprit, arrest him and then charge him. Was he wrong? According to the newspaper stories, and for that matter what the Trehernes had told me, the whole thing could hardly be more straightforward. But eight years later, Cecily Trehern had thought otherwise, and she had disappeared.
There wasn't much more to do in London. It seemed obvious to me that I would have to talk to Stefan Codrescu, which meant visiting him in prison. But I didn't even know where he was being held and the Trehernes had been unable to help. How was I supposed to find out? I went back on the internet, but I didn't find anything there. Then I remembered an author I knew, Craig Andrews. He had come to writing late, and I had published his first novel, a thriller set in the prison system. On first reading, I had been impressed by the violence of his writing, but also by its authenticity. He had done a lot of research. Of course, he had another publisher now. Cloverleaf Books had rather let him down by going out of business and burning to the ground. But on the other hand, the book had been a success, and I had noticed a good review of his latest in the Mail on Sunday. I had nothing to lose, so I sent him an email telling him that I was back in England and asking him if he could help me track down Stefan. I wasn't confident that he would reply. After that, I packed up my laptop, grabbed my suitcase and rescued my MG from the car park, where it had already been charged a ridiculous sum of money for the grim, dusty corner where it had been housed. It still made me happy to see it. I got in and moments later I was roaring down the exit ramp and out onto the Farringdon Road, on my way to Suffolk. <laughs>